we'd like to offer as a church our gifts to you as a very Merry Christmas. We love you and um, we are very appreciative for what you've just done, not just for the past year, but literally for your life, for you and your wife, for what you've done for our ministry. And we'd just like to take this time as a church to present to you your gifts. Oh, thank so, you. if you want to, go ahead and open that one first. Okay. <laughs> It's not Christmas yet. It's cheating, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Do you I have save the paper? No. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> okay. Oh, my goodness. I don't know what that is. Wow. <laughs> That's very nice. It's a Michael Stroll yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a Microsoft Surface Pro. It's like way too nice a computer for me. <laughs> oh, wow, thank you guys. Tissue paper. Yeah. I know that's not I'm supposed to preach after having a brand new computer for <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Protection for it. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. I don't know what to say. <laughs> and that, well, thank coming. you and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Let's see you all later. See you. Stylus pen oh, wow. for his uh, Surface Pro. So I don't even know what again. that is. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, Merry Christmas. Alright, let's go ahead and stand for our final song, which I'm sorry, our final song, hymn number 85. And then after our final song, we'll have special music. Hymn number 85, Silent Night, Holy Night. Sweet. 
tried it during the song service and it was fun. So, be amazed at what's fun uh, when you're kind of on lockdown. You can't move, you can't make noise. How much fun a little noise or a little movement is. Uh, it's human nature, I suppose. Matthew chapter, I said chapter 6, I meant chapter 7. Did I say 7? I said 7? Well, I said the right one. Normally I say the one right before, or I say this verse and I say now look back uh, to the verse before that verse. So I'm not sure why that is, but it's part of the program, the way I'm, I uh, think. Thank you so much for generous uh, Christmas gift. I was a little taken aback there. I wasn't expecting that. And uh, don't expect anything as far as gifts go. The truth of the matter is, is that I actually, uh, for a couple of years, have wanted a Microsoft Surface Pro, but they're too expensive to justify buying. So I just have <laughs> not bought one. And uh, so that's very, very generous of you as a church to buy me something that, like that. 
and uh, now I have to worry about hiding it, so no one will steal it. So it's, it's a problem. <laughs> All right, Matthew, Matthew chapter seven. The junior church kids want me to open it on the front row and play with it there. And I kind of felt like they had a good point, but. <laughs> This is a wonderful passage of Scripture, and it's not confusing, and so I'd like to just preach it as written this morning, and we'll actually be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 as well, because I want to look at really God's overview, God's thought uh, about this topic. Look at verse 1 of chapter 7, we'll read that verse, and uh, then we will pray and get right into the text. Judge not, that ye be not judged. Father, I pray that you would help us this morning with this passage of Scripture. God, we don't need to prove what we believe this morning. This morning we need to know what you say and adopt or apply what you say to our lives. And we just ask that you would give us understanding of this passage. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite lines to use, not in seriousness, but in sarcasm, is the, you don't know me, you can't judge me line. You know that one? You don't know me, you can't judge me. It's just fun to say it, but it's fun to say it because I've heard it said so often. Isn't it true? People yeah. say, you don't know me, you can't judge me. Or people say, judge not. Or I've heard it said, some people will say things like, um, you know what, I don't judge. I don't judge. Now, the fact of the matter is that none of those statements on the face value or underlying value are actually accurate. You don't know me, you can't judge me. Well, it's true, isn't it, that I don't know the inner workings of the heart of a man? Isn't that true? But uh, the Bible very, very plainly says a couple of things about the heart. It says, uh, out of the mouth proceedeth what? Well, things that come from the heart. Uh, the Bible says about, for instance, treasures. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I can look at what an individual treasures and I can see where their heart is or what's in the heart. Isn't it true? You look at what a person treasures, what a person values, and you'll see what's in the heart. Or what isn't in the heart? You find a person that treasures spiritual things. I mean, yeah, I'm mean, not talking about you know pretend to treasure spiritual things, but I mean you could tell in a person's life they treasure eternal things, eternal matters. You can see that, can't you? And so it's a little bit of a misnomer, first of all, to say you don't know me, you can't judge me. The truth of the matter is, is that to some degree I can know a little bit, bit about anybody based on the exposure that I have to that person, right? You ever made a bad first impression? You ever made a bad first impression? I do sometimes. Uh, Sunday evening, the Waldrons were here, and uh, Beth Waldron's twin sister was here sitting next to Brother Matt, and I said, hey, are you Matt's mom? I've done that twice, actually. Two times when I've thought that a lady was a man's mother instead of sister, or, you know, peer. Actually, you know, the difference between a mom and a sister is only a few years, you know. Twenty. What's 20 years, give or take, right? right? Chuck, what's 20 years, give or take? Not much, is it? No. No. See, so I have a good point about that, but that doesn't make a good first impression. That lady will hate me forever. Uh, <laughs> there's a lady in my parents' church in Kansas who uh, is sister to a man there, and uh, honestly, he's probably nearing 70, and she's his sister and a sibling, so I'm not going to take a guess at her age. However, the first time I met her, which would be some 10 years ago, I said, are you Hank's mom? Every time I see her, I've seen her, I don't know, 50 times since then. Oh yeah, you're the one that said, are you Hank's mom? Like, she'll never forget me. I forgot who she was a lot of times until she's reminded me that I asked if she was Hank's mom. So I've made bad first impressions, haven't you? Yeah. Okay, so... It would be unfair to say that a brief glimpse at somebody is not a good overview of a person's life, isn't it? And it would be fair to say, wouldn't it, that uh, it's not 
fair for us to evaluate an individual by one thing that they've done while ignoring everything else in their life. It's fair, isn't it? Okay, so when somebody says, you don't know me, you can't judge me, well, actually, I don't think that's really a, a, an accurate statement. It's not an accurate thing to say. It's clever, I guess, but it really isn't true because most of the time when they say that to someone, they're saying it to somebody that actually does know them. And uh, knowing somebody or not knowing them isn't what gives you the right to judge. Is it? Hey, that, that, that really has nothing to do with the point, is it? The second thing that people say oftentimes is, don't judge me, or you can't judge me. And you know, those, those could be true. The first, one, uh, the first one is a command that you probably can't enforce, but the reality of it is, and I realized this some long time ago, is that I may make in my mind judgments about a person, but the judgment doesn't enforce anything for the person. In, in other words, outside of the ability to gossip or slander someone, my judgment of someone really has no impact on them. I don't have the right to sentence anyone to anything. Do I? I, I can't say, you know, you're guilty, Tony. You're sentenced to and give him an appropriate or subsequent sentence. I've wanted to judge Charlie for being late for years. I wanted to give him an appropriate sentence, but it just, I, I can't. I can't do anything about it. You know, you're pastor. You're not judge. So, uh, you just, they're just things you can't do because you don't have the right. So I may judge or have a predetermined notion about a person, but I don't have the ability to pass judgment on a person, do I? Actually, so the statement, you can't judge me, usually normally stands alone. God has actually, if we were to study authority system, created the authority to make judgment in its appropriate context. Uh, you won't succeed in standing in a court of law and telling the judge, you don't know me, you can't judge me. <laughs> now you could say those words, but the judge will say, oh, I'm going to get to know you. And I've already made some judgments. <laughs> right? Okay, so God had, and, and who established government authority? The Bible says that they are, government authority is given to us, right? By who? By God. They're God's authority. They represent God. So who made government authority? God did. So let me ask you a question. If you told a judge that represents an appellate court, you can't judge me, would that be true or false? False. False. I sometimes, if you ever you know, are stranded somewhere and you don't have anything to occupy your brain cells with, go on YouTube and watch some of these uh, sovereign men tell judges that they can't judge them. You yeah, anybody here ever heard of the sovereign man, the guy that doesn't recognize any country and he is his own sovereign being, and then he ends up breaking a law and going to court and trying to spew his nonsense to a judge, and guess where the sovereign man goes? The sovereign man goes to a real jail. <laughs> so, uh, he may say, I'm sovereign, I'm my own person, my individual person, you don't have the right to judge me, but the judge seems to have some authority to do some things in spite of the sovereign man's rejecting of his authority. And that's good for us to think about, actually. You know, most people rankle at the notion of judgment. Isn't it so? How many of you like to be told you're wrong or told that you're going to be corrected about a wrong? None of us like it in our nature. Now, it is true that when we become more modeled after the character of Jesus, it is true that we do welcome criticism a lot more. Tell me about what you see in my life because I want to be like Jesus and if there's something in my life that isn't reflective of Christ then I need to hear it. And though we may not like to know that we're wrong, actually we need to. And you know, I find that if you have that attitude, then you sort of welcome not even having to hear people, but to hear God's Spirit bring correction into your life and judgment into your life. Okay, how about this one? Only God can judge me. 
All judgment comes from God. But God uses people to judge some, doesn't He? Okay, so now I want to examine the Scripture this morning. And I don't want to teach that the Scripture is not saying judge not. Because that's what some people do when they teach this passage of Scripture. In other words, they say, I know this is what the Bible says here, but that isn't what it's saying. And then they spend time showing what the Bible says in other places. Uh, I actually want to look at what it's saying. And actually, it's not that, that uh, complicated. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 7, Judge not, and what are the next several words? Lest ye be judged. That ye be not judged. Now that word that is a word that comes from a conjunction which teaches purpose. So you could say, you could add two words to that in order to understand purpose. In order that ye be not judged. You get that? Okay. Judge not in order that ye be not judged. Or judge not that ye be not judged. So it shows the reason a person would not want to judge. Okay, now, I don't want to be silly and I want to be trite, but a good reason not to stand in judgment of somebody might be because you yourself fall short in the area of things uh, that could be judged in your life. Now, I don't know that there's a, an equation that substantiates this or a percentage. I love uh, about uh, percentages just making up my own statistics. Don't you love statistics and just making your own? Yep. So let me make one up right now. 90% of the people who like to judge others have glaring faults in their own lives. Isn't it so? Actually. Matter of fact, when some people come to share with me something that's wrong about somebody else wanting me to do something or speak to the person or let them know that they've got a fault, 90%, I'm, this is a made-up percentage, understand this, but it's just the fun of statistics. It's a made-up statistic. 90% of the time, while they're telling me what's wrong with the other person, I'm thinking, you've got a lot of nerve. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, it's surprising to me that you're so hung up over that problem with that person when these are the glaring faults in your own life. In other words, if you read the verse as written, the Bible says, Judge not that, or in order that, ye be not judged. And so we see from the Scripture that a good way to come under God's judgment is to stand in judgment. Isn't that what the Scripture is saying? In other words, have you ever prayed this? God, thanks for not killing me. I have. God, thanks for not killing me. And God, I, I'm trying to get right. <laughs> have you ever confessed your sins? You're just you're struggling with an area of victory in your life. Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's a lack of discipline, like laziness. How many of y'all are lazy? How many of y'all here are lazy? I don't believe the rest of you. <laughs> you know, the reality of it is, I'm always under conviction about about personal discipline. And when I look at other people's lives, I think they're less disciplined than I am, so they're probably under conviction too, as well. <laughs> Isn't it so? Okay. Um, whenever I deal with this matter, this issue personally of getting right, about not, being, not redeeming the time for the Lord Jesus, you know, I usually pray to God like this, something like this. I say, God, you know I'm just a failure. You know, you've given me so many opportunities and so many chances. And I just feel like so many times I've just failed. I, and God, I don't even feel right asking forgiveness, but I need it. I need you to forgive me. And God, I want your help. Help me to be honest and keep my word when I tell you I'm going to serve you. Help me. And I pray and I ask that. And I usually... Well, and coupled in that prayer is something along the lines of, thanks for not killing me. Thanks for not just letting me have it because I deserve it. I better be careful, hadn't I, with picking at minor problems in other people's lives while I ignore major ones in my life. Let's, let's just read the rest of the text. It's simple. It's not, not complicated. It's a simple text, simple message. Uh, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. 
Here's something fun. Uh, you'd be surprised how often people come to me and tell me about other people's problems. Pastor, this person is doing, or this person is dot, 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 dot. Sometimes my response is, what would you like me to do? I remember a teenager that I had. And he, he, he was unique. Uh, let me just put it that way so you don't misunderstand. He was unique. And uh, he wasn't nice to the other teenagers. And so because he wasn't nice to them, they responded in kind. They picked on him. And they would say things and upset him. And he would come. I remember him coming to me and Mrs. Price one time. And he said, they said this to me. And it wasn't a nice thing that they said. You know, they were just they were they were getting him wound up. And uh, so I said, okay. He said, do something. I said, what would you like me to do? He said, hurt them. <laughs> he was 15. He says, hurt them. You know, he wanted me to harm them. You know, what do you want me to do? Hurt them. I always think when somebody comes and tells me something, I say, what would you like me to do? I think of this individual. I won't say his name, but I think of this individual. And he would say, hurt them. And he meant it. He wanted me to, you know, uh, to give him a smackdown. He wanted somebody to get hurt. He wanted some bone crushing, some knee breaking or something. You know, on the part of pastor, that isn't my pastoral responsibility, by the way. That's why in our churches we have things called death angels and uh, <laughs> prayer warriors. That's their job, not mine. Okay, yeah, okay. You guys didn't know what those titles meant, did you? It's a joke. Smile. Okay, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> the pastor doesn't hurt people, neither. Okay, never mind. <laughs> We're never going to get back on track if we're not careful. Okay, so with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. The Scripture simply is saying your attitude towards someone else and your desire for them to have judgment is what you will receive for judgment. Now let me just say this. Forming an opinion is not judgment. Forming an opinion is not judgment. Sentencing is judgment. Sentencing is a judgment. Do you see the difference? Now let me just tell you something. You do have to some degree the ability to sentence people. Some of you, there are people who in your mind have done wrong and it's an unforgivable offense. In other words, in your mind, they'll never have the opportunity to ever be right with you because you've sentenced them. In other words, they'll never be able to fellowship with you. Or they'll never in your mind be as good as you or be allowed to serve because you in your mind have sentenced them. They've had a permanent... You know, I've heard people say, I'll never have any respect for that person. Well, that's a sentence, isn't it? You have just said, I will behave in this way toward this person forever. And that, that to some degree is a judgment or a sentence. But you do understand the difference between judging and uh, having an opinion, don't you? A judgment actually has consequence. And so Jesus said, you know, be careful about this matter of judgment because the measure that you judge or what the judgment that you judge, you shall be judged with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now I can imagine the same teenager that said, hurt them. I can imagine his response when he wronged the other teenagers if I were to hurt him. See, what you want to happen to someone else, you better be look out because it'll happen to you. I've heard, you know, people talk big talk about, you know, about consequences. You know, I, they ought to just cut their hands off. They ought to just lop off their feet. You know, in other countries, and we talk about justice systems in other countries and what they do. And I'm not saying that, you know, there shouldn't be some, some type of corporal punishment in a public way. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not really commenting on that this morning. What I'm saying is you better look out you better look out. Have you ever done something in a day that you didn't plan on doing? You ever get up in the morning and read your Bible and you're in fellowship with the Lord and then you speak to a person and everything goes south? 20 minutes after being in fellowship with God, you have said things you should not have said. You have thought things you shouldn't have thought. And an hour later, you're thinking, now how did I get from point A to point B? How did I get here? better look out. You better look out when you don't have any mercy on somebody who's in the wrong place. Now, here's the question. 
Is the Bible here saying then pass no judgment whatsoever, ever? No. Actually, it's not saying that at all. It says the reason not to judge is so that you don't be judged because the way that you judge is the way that you'll be judged and the measure that you give out is the measure that you'll be given. And some of y'all are pretty extreme. Small wonder, consequences in your life can be extreme. I've heard it phrased this way. Well, you know, it's, I've had you know all kinds of things happen to me. I don't see why it'd be so terrible for it to happen. Oh, that's really not an attitude of mercy, is it? And that's not really an attitude of Jesus. And so the scripture we're hearing is not saying judge not that, or just judge not. It's saying judge not that you be not judged. And then the Bible says in verse four, "How wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote that is, or the mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye." And the words here are piece of fuzz, <laughs> speck versus stick. Okay, so let me get the speck out of your eye, and while you are trying to pull a speck out of your brother's eye, you've got a beam in your own eye. In other words, you're in a lot worse shape than they are, but you're trying to fix them. So what is being implied here? Well, I believe what's being implied here is that judgment must come to the house of the Lord, or judgment must come here before judgment ever goes there. The Scripture is not saying never judge. It's saying don't judge if you don't want to be judged the way you're judging. Now let me ask you a question. Has judgment ever been helpful in your life? Yes. Yes, it actually has, hasn't it? Let me ask another question. Might judgment be helpful in someone else's life? Yes. Yes. Is judgment good or evil? It's good. Actually, it's actually good. The problem is the execution of it, the manner of the execution of it. And this is one place in the Bible where the Scripture teaches that not only does it matter what you say, but it matters how you say it. I get tired of that statement a lot of times, don't you? When people completely ignore the truth of something because they say, well, it isn't what you said, it's how you said it. And I've tried saying things a lot of different ways, and I found out, no, it's actually what you said. <laughs> it isn't how you said it. Uh, I remember... Uh, I, back in, when I was in, in college, I had to, to be a floor leader. I was in charge of, the, I think, 60 guys or so in my hall, just making sure that they did the general things that they committed to do when they signed up to go to school there. So I had to check to make sure they were in bed for lights out. And they told us, our residence manager told us, he said, I'm not joking about lights out. I want these guys in bed at lights out. You make sure they get in bed. After lights out, if they're not in bed, write them up. Give them demerits because they need to go to sleep. We're not going to have we're not, we're going to have a zero tolerance policy. I worked for the school. I was paid to do it, and so it was my job. So I remember going in uh, after lights out, and some guys were up doing sit-ups and clowning around the room. And I said, "Guys, get in bed." And they got in bed. I came back five minutes later, and they were up again. And so I wrote them up. I said, "Guys, I told you to get in bed." And I wrote I I wrote they got their ID numbers. And I wrote demerits for them. And the next day, my floor leader partner came and he said, "These guys are really really mad at you." And I said, yeah, I wrote them up. So I went in to talk to them about it. And they said the whole, it isn't what you said. And they said, you just, when you wrote us up, you acted just as, like, you know, like it's just no big deal. It's just like, a, just, just calm. You know, they said, you are like stone cold Steve Austin writing, uh, you know, demerits. You know, you just, you showed no emotion when you wrote the demerits. I came that night and they were up after lights out. I said, hey guys. Oh, I'm writing you up. <laughs> and I laughed the whole time. I said, it's going to be fun. You're going to the uh, uh, discipline committee. You're going to have to go to discipline committee and explain to the deans why you're up two nights in a row. I wrote them up. <laughs> and they said to my partner that they were upset because I was happy when I wrote them up. <laughs> So I came the next night and I said, I'm sick of this. And I yelled at him when I wrote him up. Did you know that out of three instances of writing them up, they didn't like any of them? I mean, I tried to be all things to all men that I might by all means, you know, save some. They didn't like being written up at all. Even when I was happy writing them up, when I was angry writing them up, or when I was stoic and calm writing them up, made no difference. They didn't like my attitude. He knows we're that way up toward judgment sometimes, aren't we? 
In other words, this whole, it isn't what you said, it's how you said it. It can be very dishonest when we say that statement. But, sometimes it can be true, can it? Hurt them! Do something! Is perhaps not the attitude that we speak when somebody's being judged. Maybe when somebody stands in the way of needing judgment in their life, perhaps our attitude ought to be one of, if at all possible, mercy. Uh, I, here's a statement that you may have grown up on. I didn't. My parents never said this to me uh, because it wouldn't have been true and they tried to be honest, I think. It hurts you more than it hurts me. Any of y'all ever have it hurts you more than it hurts me, parents? This no. hurts... This it hurts th me more than it hurts Yeah, you. that's it. This hurts me more than... They, they, my parents would have said it the other way. This definitely going to hurt you way more than me. Trust me. <laughs> this is going to hurt... This is going to hurt me. We, we had a spanking family. Our house, or a whooping family, or a beating family, or whatever you want to call it. That's the kind of family we had. And uh, my parents never said it, but my friends all did. I, I remember being with my friends and, and having their parents say to them, this is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. No kid ever believes that, by the way. I don't think a kid's ever going to believe it. It may be true. It probably is true. But no kid will ever believe it. Um, there does need to be a desire for mercy and judgment, doesn't there? I want to look at one last principle, though, that, that ought to help us as we understand judgment. First, several of the things that we've said, first of all, uh, the Bible is not saying judge not. The Bible is saying judge not that you be not judged. In other words, the purpose in not judging is that you don't receive the same thing, which is a lack of mercy that you meet out. Of course, if you ever want mercy, perhaps you'd better administer it. I, many times... I have realized when somebody has done wrong with me, I, many times I've realized, you know something? I better be careful about coming down too hard on this person because I've needed mercy in my life and I certainly will again. And so it would be better that I'm merciful because Jesus says, what you do is what will be done to you. Now this is not karma. Karma is a copy of this. A lot of people talk about karma. It's not karma. See, this is simply Jesus saying, this is my law. This is what happens. Now, verse 5. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. And here's what Jesus is telling his disciples. He said, get your, get your own life clean. And then help other people. First, Cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Don't be a hypocrite in judgment. First, get the thing that is inhibiting your eyesight out. You know, sometimes we're blind because of things that are in our lives. The things that are in our lives blind us to what we actually are. And at the same time, somehow we can see past the things that we're blind to in our lives and we can see little things in other people's lives. It's actually surprising to me that the more a person seems that they are out of fellowship with the Lord, the more critical they are of those who are in fellowship. I saw this posted on Facebook by a fake Facebook friend. That is a friend. I don't actually know who he is, but he's one of my Facebook friends. And uh, he said something to the degree of, I've been driving a truck, and uh, you know I meet people. Every, like, you know, only truck drivers actually meet people in the real world. But I've been meeting people in the real world that are just great people. And I've been meeting people that are saying that you've got to go to church. And there are better people in the world than there are in church. The first thought was, what's your point? Okay. How, how do you know that the people that you've met that are great people don't go to church? First of all. But actually, what if you read down in his comments when people commented back, the comments that he commented on, basically what he was saying was, I'm not going to church, and I don't want anybody telling me I need to go to church. And so, his way of justifying his action was to say, the people in church are unkind and they're hypocrites, and the people out of church are saints. And that's just silly, actually, isn't it? Are there sinners in the church? Yes, yes there are. Certainly are. Who in the church argues that? <laughs> we 
We know what we are, don't we? You know, we come in this place, we know what we're made of. Listen, there's nobody in this place saying, you know, I'm surprised that we had a sinner show up today. <laughs> no, this, this place is full of that, isn't it? We are sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No, actually what we have is people that aren't in fellowship with God that actually say, I'm not a sinner. And you can't judge me. You can't call me a sinner. The reality of it is that they're overlooking their sin, isn't it so? So, here's the question. Can we judge people? Can we judge people? Very quickly, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'd like to look at what the Bible teaches. The Scripture today is not arguing that there is no such thing as judgment or that we cannot be judged or that we cannot judge anyone. The Scripture today is saying don't be a hypocrite. <clears throat> Isn't it so? Don't be a hypocrite and judge people when you need judgment yourself. Well, what a tragedy it is when somebody who represents law, who represents judgment, is found to be corrupt. It's really a mess, isn't it? When a police officer who arrests people for trafficking in drugs is found trafi trafficking drugs. It's tragedy when a judge who prosecutes people is exposed as a criminal. That's a tragedy, isn't it? Because it's the hypocrisy of being willing to stand in judgment of others when you sell yourself are covering up your own wickedness. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Okay? So here's the scenario, and I, I'd like to preach this whole passage of Scripture. I'm actually completely out of time already, so I can't. But 1 Corinthians 6 says... How dare you to take a believer and go into a court of a law against another believer and prosecute them? Now, I will qualify this by saying this is a believer against a believer, not a believer who's broken the law. In other words, if you've broken the law, and even if it was another against another person, it's not the, the person that you've broken the law against responsibility to judge you. Or not judge you or forgive you, actually. Because you've broken a law and you need to be prosecuted for breaking the law. You get it? Okay, so if I pull out of the parking lot here today, and have you noticed, you got to really watch this, this street right down here because there's no stop sign for them, but there is a stop sign for the street across on 9th Avenue, or I mean, I'm sorry, 49th. Be careful when you come to 49th that you always stop and look left. Because if people are driving out of those parking lots down there, they have the right of way, and if you don't stop, you'll hit them. And guess who will be at fault? You will. Okay, now, if you are coming from the parking lot down there, and I'm in a hurry to get to church, it's an emergency, you know, I'm only five minutes early and I wanted to be 15, and so I come racing past the stop sign, and you're coming by, and I slam into your vehicle, spin it around, and so forth, uh, I've broken the law. And it's really not up to you to decide whether or not I get a ticket for running the stop sign. It's up to the law enforcement, isn't it? Actually. In other words, now, you could forgive me for breaking the law, spinning you around, breaking your back or your neck or injuring you, whatever. You could forgive me, but actually the reality of it is, is that it's not a matter between me and you. It's a matter between me and the law. I, I ran the stop sign. That isn't your stop sign. That isn't your law. That's our society's law, and that's God's authority, God's government that He's given us that put that stop sign there. And when I break that law, it's not yours to forgive me. If the government decides to forgive me, that's fine. But you can't. You cannot. You understand that? Uh, there are many believers in churches who are wrestling with serious issues because of uh, terrible things that have been committed against them by people in the church. And I just I won't say anything specific, but just awful things that have been done. And the reality of it is, is that those people need to be prosecuted or you'll never be right. It's not your right to forgive some things. When someone's done something that's against the law, the law needs to judge them, not you. You're not standing in judgment. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, though, says that you and I are not to have matters against each other and go to court against each other. Can you give me a scenario where two Christians could go to court against each other? Let me give you an easy one. Divorce. When a married couple sues each one another for divorce. That's illegal. 
how's the testimony of Jesus when two people who are believers break up their marriage because they can't get along? Or because of anything? That's terrible, isn't it? It's a terrible testimony. So that would be a good example, so let's leave it at that. Okay, so then the Bible says, verse 2, do, not, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? In other words, someday in Christ's kingdom, we're going to be judges. And we're going to judge the world. This will be during the millennial reign of Jesus. And we literally are going to be judging the lost. We're going to reign with Jesus and we're going to be judges with Him. That's what the Bible says. And we can't police ourselves in the church. That's the notion. In verse 4, if you then have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church. Now, he's not saying your qualification for being a judge is to be have little esteem. He's just simply saying the person in the church who is least esteemed is more qualified to judge the saints than a person in the world when the saints are going to judge the world. Sabe? Make sense? Okay. If then ye, or I'm sorry, in verse 5, I speak to your shame. Is it so there's not a wise man among you? No, and not one that shall be able to judge between the brethren, but brother goeth the law with brother. Okay, so let me just suffice it here to say, I can't preach this passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 6, but let me just simply say that when Jesus told His disciples, judge not, He was not saying you'll never be in a position of judgment, was He? Actually, God's Word in the Scripture says that the saints are supposed to, in particular instances, Judge between one another, actually. And so God is not eradicating or annihilating the notion of judgment so that we can be free-spirited re rebels that go around and say, no one in the world can judge me, is he? What God is saying is don't be hypocrites. Be real. And friend, this really is where the rubber meets the road, and I want to draw uh, the net here and just finish this up. You know, we as believers need to have some serious humility in our lives. One of the best attributes of a Christian, one of the most practical attributes of a Christian, is the attribute of humility. Simply saying, you know, I never say I couldn't do what you're doing, I'm just simply saying God says that's wrong. And there's a big difference between saying God says that's wrong and between me saying I can't believe the kind of person you are, I'd never do that, you're terrible. Isn't there? Because the reality when people come to me and say, I can't believe someone could do that, my thought usually is I can. Honestly, I've had enough life experience to know I could be a pretty terrible person just because of the sin nature that I possess. Unless you get to feeling like you're a lot better, you are a lot better than anyone else here, my friend. I've come to conclude that you're pretty terrible too. We all are. You know, that's pretty accurate because the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's why we need a Savior, isn't it? The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And my friend, one of the most comforting things I can ever realize is that I'm terrible, but there's a loving Savior who died in my place. You know, a person who judges isn't likely to receive forgiveness for his own sin because he'll always ignore the evil that he's done. People go to hell because they're willing to judge and not be judged. You realize that? You know what we could use a good dose of? Some humility and self-judgment. And an unwillingness to stand in judgment until we've received judgment. So, do we understand Matthew chapter 7 this morning? The Scripture is, saying, is not saying you can't judge. The Scripture is saying... You can't judge without being judged. And before you judge, judge yourself. Clean up your act. Clean up your life. Don't be a hypocrite. Adopt some humility. And you know, that's the kind of people we need to judge the world, don't we? I have honestly, uh, many times in my life, I've been in a court of law, sometimes for myself, mostly for others. And one of the things that I normally have been impressed by, actually, is the humility of the judges. I've actually never been in a court of law where I thought, you know, I can't believe that made that guy a judge. Honestly, every time I've been there, I thought, you know, that guy, he 
he's got a lot of humility. You know, when you get a ticket, on the ticket it tells you how to dress for court, doesn't it? It says, basically, coat and tie is appropriate. You should dress up. I watch people shuffle into court looking like absolute slobs. You say, Pastor, it's the best they have. I don't believe so. <laughs> I don't think so. I've watched them when the judge calls their name instead of referring respectfully, yes, Your Honor, no, Your Honor, and, and standing at attention. I've seen them slouch in. I've seen them mouth off, say things that aren't appropriate. And I've watched judges sit there, and I've thought, you know, I'd throw the book at you, buddy. I wouldn't take that from you for an instance. I've watched judges be very lenient with the same people. What do you suppose makes a judge lenient with someone who really doesn't even deserve leniency. What do you suppose makes them that way? I think it's humility. I think it's self-judgment. I think it's a judge saying, you know what? I'm not in that person's shoes, but I could be. You know, I don't know what they're going through. I don't know what this is a response out of. And I know it's going to cause some serious problems in their life, but it's not personal, actually. And who am I anyway? I'm just a servant of the court. I'm just here to do a job. And I'm not here to have my personal will enforced on this person's life. I'm here to see justice done. We could sure use some of that, couldn't we, in our lives? I'm not concerned that this person gets what I think should be coming to them because I'm glad I never got what was coming to me. I just want to do right. I want to do right by the person. And friend, that's how judgment happens for believers. Father, I pray that you would help us to absorb this truth and to apply it in our lives. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you had from the message this morning more questions that came into your mind or you felt like, Pastor... You know, there's something there that you didn't speak about or you didn't deal with, but it occurred to me. If you've got a question like that, I love it when you come and ask those questions. You won't offend me by saying, you know, you can even come and say, well, you know, I don't see it that way. I didn't see it. And we could open the Word of God and look at maybe how you see it differently. And it isn't because it's a debate about how the Word of God uh, is, is intended or written, but it's because... None of us are perfect, or maybe everything that could be covered wasn't covered. And so I want you to know as a pastor, I'm always available for questions after I've preached a message. I also want you to know there's always an invitation for you to respond to the message, even if we don't have a go back or come forward invitation in our service. And so I hope that, that you understand that and understand the spirit behind that. I want to thank you for being here this morning. We are going to have a baptism uh, at this time. And so, um, I know Starge is getting baptized. Tashi, today? Not today? You think you came? Okay, so you came prepared to be baptized today? I don't know what to do. Should I walk something that's different? You can get baptized in what you're wearing as long as you're willing to be wet. So, okay. Uh, so we'll get ready for baptism. I need to change real quickly, so I'm going to ask Brother Tosh uh, to go ahead and uh, lead us in a song while I get prepared. And then we'll have baptism here in just a minute. Okay? Let's sing hymn number 166. Yeah.